change how a system behaved, but as an index into a database so that you could tr retrieve information. So it wasn't just about his lap long, but it was about the weather that day. It was about all these different factors that we think about when we try and index into our brain to, to pull back some information, but are not, we're not traditionally in these kinds of systems. But again, these were all tended to be fairly simple systems. But in the last, you know, since then, the last 15 years or so, we've seen a lot of different trends uh, in computing that have uh, lended itself to a, a much wider variety of kind of things that we can, we can deal with. So, first we see huge changes in size. When I first got into computer science, the idea of a mobile computer was something much more of what's on the left, and now today you can buy, this is the smallest one I can find on Amazon. It's about this, it's probably about this big. Uh, I don't know how you ever use that phone. Uh, but you can buy something that's incredibly, incredibly small, and we've seen how Computation really has changed uh, in its, its size. So this is a picture of an IBM mainframe from 1962 that ran half of, so there are two of these, and you can see they fill a room, that ran half of the uh, scheduling information for American Airlines, the reservation system. Then in the 80s we had uh, desktops, and then later we got into de uh, uh, laptops, and then tablets and phones. Now we're certainly in the era of wearables. I'd venture to say that a lot of people now have these devices that are commercially available. And we are moving slowly, very slowly, into this world of implantables. So <clears throat> the idea that we can take more and more processing power and sensing ability and put it into a smaller package is really here. Uh, this was the first phone I ever had. Uh, my advisor was kind enough to, well, he had a project with Motorola at the time, and he was kind enough to give me one of these phones. And, it, it very much felt like, uh, even the action of the phone, the opac opening the phone very much felt like a tricorder in, uh, in from Star Trek, uh, hence the name Star Trek. Uh, and, but in terms of its sensing capability, it was extremely limited. It really had access to uh, the cell phone towers, but pretty much no other information. If you break down a current phone, a current phone, you see a tremendous number of sensing capabilities. Um, and some things that are, we don't even think of as a traditional sensor, uh, but we use all the time. So the fact that my phone has a touch screen can be, means that I can use pressure on the screen and placement on my finger on the screen to, to collect additional kinds of information. And then finally, uh, the kind of processing power that's available has uh, increased incredibly. The Apple iPhone X at its peak can do 350 gigaflops uh, per second, which is this pretty amazing given the kinds of computers that I, I certainly grew up with. And so what that has meant in terms of uh, moving away from these very simple kinds of context, location, time, these very atomic pieces of information, we can now start to look at activities. Every one of you has a phone. Every one of you probably has a phone that can detect what activity you're performing. Had a course grain, sitting, standing, running, lying down, being on a bike, being on a in a, in a vehicle. Um, these systems can figure out meaningful locations. So I know on my Google phone, when I, get a new, when I get a new phone or I log in with a new account, it takes two days for my phone to recognize where my home is. Now that's not a particularly hard problem for it to get mostly correct. Right? Uh, if you just look at where people spend the majority of their time at night, that tends to be their home. And it only takes a couple of days for it to start recognizing that and then start giving you information about how do you get from here to your home. There's been a huge interest, uptake in the interest of, uh, in health behaviors and uh, uh, being able to detect a lot of different factors that lead into an assessment of someone's health. And a lot of people here are working in this area too. And the last piece is that uh, people have been, uh, more and more recently researchers have been looking at the sense of engagement. Can we use, how people use different kinds of technology to see not just how engaged are they in the technology, but how are they engaged with each other. So this was really great. I started thinking about, okay, well, People are or people have moved into this field, and that's great. I did a little bit of work in this myself, but I wanted to figure out what was next. Um, and I went back, and I was just looking at some of my old, an old keynote talk I gave uh, from probably about 13, about 12 or 13 years ago, just after I got to Carnegie Mellon. And I found this slide, and I, at that time I said, the holy grail of a system that's context-aware, that can take into account information that's around a person, that's about a person, for to, the reason we want to collect that information is that so we can use that to understand human intent. And obviously, we're not at a place where we can use technology to understand that. And right now, or then, we use location and time as a common proxy for intent. So if I'm in this space at this time, I can try and infer that intent. 
Um, you all being here at this time, I can try and understand what your intent is. But it was a really, really poor proxy. The fact that we happen to share space and time does not mean that we want the same thing. And so one of the goals I've, I've tried to figure out, or one of the things I've been trying to figure out is, how can I come up with a better uh, representation of human intent? <clears throat> So I started looking at uh, this idea of routines. Um, and routines are interesting for a lot of different things. So this is an example of a, 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 a particular routine a, a, for a child. And you can see it's the, a routine is just a set of activities that you might perform one after another. And this is the, this, in this case, it's the routine of a school day at a fairly coarse level. Um, and what's interesting about it are there are different uh, activities in that routine, they happen in different orders, they take different amounts of time, and they can be deviated, you can deviate from those routines, either in common ways or in uncommon ways. So in my research about routines, I found this book um, by Mason Curry uh, called The Daily Routines of Famous Creative People, and then somebody went, came along and actually created an information visualization out of this. Um, and so it shows the routines of famous artists, scientists, uh, mostly artists and scientists, some politicians. Um, and it shows, and I don't know how they collected any of this information, by the way. Uh, but assuming that the information is correct, it shows you the routine of a typical work day or a typical day for some very famous people, from, people from Benjamin Franklin to Beethoven to Charles Darwin. And you can see. Lots of interesting patterns, nothing that I can sort of pull up and say, well, if you want to be really successful, do this. Uh, but to me, it was really interesting that you could start to put together this kind of information. And I would say, oh, if I were an assistant to this person and I had this picture in my head for Charles Darwin, how would my behavior change? What would I do in order to be the most effective to him? So routines are important for a lot of different reasons. The, the most, to me, the most important is that we develop these routines over time because they reduce our cognitive effort. Most of us, I'm, I'm sure some, most of you have been in a situation where you've been in a car, you're driving, and you don't even remember how you got home. Your brain just kicked into autopilot. You don't think about how you brush your teeth. You don't think much about the order in which you do things every morning on, a, on, a, on an average day because you just sort of offload that to this routine to reduce your cognitive effort. And it's only when you have to deviate from those routines, or you have an anomaly that causes this, that you start suffering from stress and this extra effort. And to me, routines are really important because they, you develop them over a long period of time, so they're really built into who you are. Um, and that means that they can be a, a barrier to change, because if you have this routine that you've been practicing for a really long time, it's hard to get out of that routine. But it also provides this nice opportunity for change. If you recognize a particular routine, you can use that to try and change somebody. Um, and from my perspective, uh, the community hasn't really picked up on this particular construct as a, a, as a resource for computation, as a resource for reasoning about. And that was something that was really exciting to me. So there has been, we're not the first people to think about this, obviously, particularly not from a computational perspective. Um, people who do work in this area, sort of an anomaly detection, in pattern recognition, but to my mind, when I think of a routine, it's much more than that. So when when we think of when I think of like applying pattern recognition, there has to be a very strict structure on um, the order in which activities occur. So if I don't see the same <coughs> pattern, it's not that it's, my system's not going to recognize it as the same thing. But any given day, particularly when I had young kids, my pattern was always changed a little bit by this by by the way what my kids did. Right? So I still brushed my teeth, I still took a shower, well, most of the time I was able to take a shower, uh, still you know, did all the things in the morning that I needed to do to get out the door, but the order I did them in and the amount of time I took them in, all of that changed. And so there's this more nuanced notion of routine that we haven't been able to capture computationally. So we first started thinking about how do we start collecting the data to be able to, to even start reasoning about this idea of routine. So we started with the phone um, because, well, all of you carried them. Uh, I remember, you know, early on in my career, we had to give people technology, and to some degree, we still do that today. But uh, we tried to get away from that because you all carry phones, and those phones are really valuable resources for reasoning about uh, routine. So we have virtual information, all the applications you use, social information because all the social applications you use, uh, let alone the calling and texting features, and then lots of sensors that are on the device to get out physical information. So we started building this infrastructure um, that's now publicly freely available called the Aware Framework. And 
Uh, it's a framework that sits on a phone that collects data, helps you reason about it, samples the data, helps you reason about it, and helps you build predictive or detection systems. And then we extended that to be really not just about phones, but actually any kind of data can fit into this. So my group, the EPCOMP lab at, at Carnegie Mellon now at the University of Washington, has really been thinking about, well, how do we understand human intent so that we can make devices that are truly smart? Um, and we want to do this by leveraging passive sensing. So I don't want to have to ask a user to perform a set of activities in order for me to understand the regime. I just want to be able to monitor them. I want to be able to observe them, but observe them through the technologies that they use. And so we've been working on novel algorithms. We've been working on how to do things in a privacy-sensitive way, which is challenging. Uh, and we've been looking at how to deploy really large systems so that we can collect and uh, identify, collect data and identify these routines. And we've done a lot of work in a bunch of different application areas. And this slide is not really for you to look at, but just to prompt me. But these are, this is a, not even quite the full list of different areas in which we worked on uh, establishing or trying to understand routines. And it ranges from uh, location-based systems, which I'll talk a little bit about, to power and sustainability applications, so being able to understand someone's very simple routine of when they leave the office and when they go home, so that you can predictively control their uh, air conditioning and heating system so it's not running all day, um, to uh, driving systems, to uh, the last batch on the bottom are all about health, health-related uh, domains. And I'll talk, I'll talk about a, a number of these, so I'll just start jumping in. This first one does not leverage routines very much, but really highlighted the value of having uh, routines as a construct. So uh, this is the work of uh, one of my former PhD students, Matthew Lee, uh, it's a system called DwellSense, and he had this idea that he wanted to study cognitive decline through the use of technology. So as people use different kinds of technology, could you tell whether they were declining in their cognitive ability? Um, so these are activities of daily living, the kinds of things that you need to be able to complete uh, well, in order to be able to live independently. He looked at these and said, which of, which of these are things that I can automatically sense? So, for example, uh, writing, uh, balancing a checkbook is something that's hard to do automatically just because of the, the nature of a piece of paper, in particular, particular artifacts. You have to go and change someone's artifact completely. Others are a little bit easier. So someone using a phone is much easier to sense because you don't actually need to change the phone itself. So he built a bunch of technology, and yes, it really did look this ugly. Um, and he, he tried, focused in on three different uh, activities of daily living. So the first was uh, taking medicine. So we instrumented a, a pill box, the kind of pill box you can get for like a couple of dollars at a drugstore. And there were two pill boxes to take back, to, uh, glued back to back, and the sensing hall was on one side, and, uh, the, and the pills could go on the other side. And the main thing he was looking at were, could you tell uh, which day of the week someone was opening? Could you tell whether they were physically having trouble opening a box? Did they get all the pills out? Did they flip it over and dump the pills out? What were the interactions with this device? He also looked at the phone line. So here he was very interested in missed calls, missed dials. So how many times did someone have to start dialing the same number before they eventually got through? Um, and then uh, this was probably the biggest instrumentation we did. We replaced everybody's coffee maker with a coffee maker that we provided them that could detect various parts of the coffee maker. All this information went up to a laptop that was in the environment and then uh, went up to our backend server. And this was a typical deployment. So this was somebody, uh, uh, an elderly person's apartment, uh, who was in our study. And you can see this person was very much in the craft. It's all our craft supplies over there. Uh, the pill boxes over here. And then we had our laptop behind the other team. And the kind of things that uh, individuals saw during the study was this just this single display. So over here, you can see, um, so on the top left here, uh, on the top line here, you can see uh, the medicine taking activity. So you can see the person, and what you saw was only what happened in the last 24 hours, the previous day. So you can see that this person took their morning medicine on time, but were con was con a little bit confused or for whatever reason made a mistake to open the Sunday, Monday, and then they finally opened the Tuesday uh, uh, bin of the, of the pill box. And they, they didn't take their afternoon medicine. And over here, you have some assessment of how well they performed the task. That same day, the previous day, they made eight phone calls, and two of them were missed dials. And then for the coffee making task, they performed it correctly, they com completed made the coffee, but they repeated one of the tasks twice. So it just gave them this assessment of how they performed the previous day. And um, this is the kind of feedback um, this is the kind of feedback um, we got from our subject. So the researcher said before, did you think you were doing it regularly? Yeah, absolutely. I would have bet this is the medicine taking task. 
Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't bet my life, but I didn't miss any days because that's one of those things about getting old. You actually physically say, no, that couldn't be. I know I took it today, and you didn't. I hate to know it because I hate to acknowledge that it's just another one of those things that you don't want happening, but this surely sh does show you what you're doing wrong. And it was that reflection on this built-up information on, their, on, on how well they, they performed this activity that was really interesting to us. So what we have here uh, are two different patients. And on the vertical axis, we have uh, from here, it's from midnight to midnight. So these would be morning medicine, these would be evening medication. And the green dot said everything was done correctly. Uh, the let, yellow dot said they, they took the pill late. And the red dots meant that they, just, they didn't take the medicine at all. And so you can see before the dis our display was deployed, we're just collecting data here. You know, this person was making a bunch of mistakes and was taking medicine late. This person, there was a lot of mistakes happening. Not so many missed ones, but a lot of mistakes happening. But it was really irregular in terms of the medicine taking. After the displays went in, their behavior changed. These, these systems may have acted like a reminder, but they were not actually reminding people what to do. And you see a lot of consistency in both the timing of the medicine, but also their adherence to the medicine taking task. And so we saw similar kinds of uh, behavior improvements for the other, uh, other tasks as well. And so originally we looked at this, okay, well we can start to automate the assessment uh, for occupational therapists. Occupational therapists can only go visit so many patients in a given period of time. Usually, okay, my, my mom is seeing an occupational therapist, and she gets to see an occupational therapist about once every four or five months. But if you could detect that someone was performing poorly or their change in, in a change in their performance over time, maybe you can more highly prioritize that particular individual. Um, where we realized that routine was the, would be interesting is uh, we had one particular individual in our study. Um, he was doing well through the first four months of the study. Uh, and you can see, you know, there were some places where he was forgetting to take the medicine. I'm sorry, not forgetting. He was late taking the medicine here and here. But in general, he was doing okay. Um, in January, he had a bad fall. He was hospitalized and he passed away. Um, but between November and January, lots of mistakes were happening. He was forgetting to take the medicine, or he was, sorry, not, he was not taking the medicine, and he was making many more mistakes, mistakes including the latest of the medicine. Now, this in and of, of itself is not predictive of anything. It's a single case, but it us it was interesting that, oh, if you can start to see change in, this, in someone's behavior, in someone's routines, maybe that's an indication that you should uh, get somebody else to look at this one. So we went from that and we started thinking, like, OK, well, can we use routines as this resource for computation, a resource for uh, uh, context, awareness? So we looked in the space of smarter navigation. Um, all of you have GPS on your phones. You all have the ability uh, to navigate with that. Um, very rarely do you ever see a built-in navigation system in San Carlo. My Lyft driver yesterday had one of those, which was uh, interesting to see because I haven't seen one in a long time. Um, and the argument here is that you can leverage a GPS to make a, a, a routine detection system, and it, does, and it doesn't have to use a lot of intelligence, a lot of computation. You can do everything on the phone. So uh, let me start out here by showing you a picture of Pittsburgh. And if you wanted to go between uh, these two locations, and you wanted to minimize the amount of travel time, that was your goal. Uh, minimize how much time it took you to get from point A to point B. That's the path you would take. And instead, if you wanted to travel the shortest distance, you'd get a different path. So it's not surprising that depending on your preference, you would get a different path. But it's not just our preference for these factors that impacts the path we take between two places. Some, for some of it, it's cost. So if I have to pay a toll, some of us would avoid paying that toll. If it's a greater cost of gasoline, we might change our behavior to more appropriately uh, optimize for cost. Um, some people have different preferences or different ability to uh, deal with uh, congestion or the kind of skill that the route takes, um, and weather conditions. So it shouldn't be surprising that you can fairly uniquely identify anybody by observing them drive. So if I get all of you to drive and I collect data from your phone, then I can fairly accurately be able to detect who is who and, and uniquely identify you. Um, because we can observe and learn new routines over time. So the question is, um, how can we get people to elicit, how can we elicit people's routines over time? And so we thought, oh, maybe we can build an interface. And of course, that was horribly wrong, because real interfaces for GPS systems are incredibly complicated. So we want to see, can we just do it by observation? Can we try and observe how everybody drives, and then extract the routines from their system? 
from the data we collect. So a traditional navigation system will you'll have your start point, you'll have your end point, and it's a big network. And all it's trying to do is minimize the amount of uh, driving distance, usually, or driving time to get from point A to point B. And that's how every, most navigation systems work. Instead, what we want to do is we want to observe that this is the path you took and try and understand what were the preferences that you exhibited on that path that caused that path to be the outcome, because there are all sorts of other paths you could have taken. And if we do this enough times, we can start to understand that, understand why you took that path and gener generate a model of your behavior. So we apply this principle of maximum entropy, and here the idea is pretty simple, which is uh, nature likes to have as much chaos as possible. And so the idea that uh, if you have a glass and you drop it, it wants to break into as many pieces as possible. That's the most common outcome. The idea that those pieces would then, uh, by themselves, combine back into a single glass is almost impossible. Not impossible, but it's almost impossible. Because of this idea of, of maximum entropy and maximum chaos. So if you combine, I'm going to skip to the map. So if you combine these, the idea is that in a maximum entropy system like this, a maximum entropy network, you want to spread the probabilities completely through the system. You want to observe particular patterns, and then you have to say there's something about the forces that are acting in the system that are causing this user to take this path. And so what are those forces? Some of it's context. It could be a weather. It could be a football game. It could be something that's affecting traffic. It could be personal preferences. And by watching enough experiences, you can figure out what those patterns are. Okay, so what can we do with this? Um, with this system, you can now personalize routes. So I can, I, you know, I've been to here in Orange County a few times, but not enough to navigate myself anywhere. If I wanted to go from here, let's say, to the airport, I, my system would produce a route that actually matches the way that I like to drive. For right now, if I get into a car and my wife gets into a car beside me, and we both use Google, it's going to tell us to take the same route. But this system actually matches the way you want to drive and you like to drive. Um, another one is predictive, uh, uh, predictive location-based services or predictive uh, hazard warning. So in learning how you behave over time, after a first few turns, the system can not only, uh, can not only have given you a route that matches where you want to go, but even without interacting with the system, it's just watching you, it can start to predict where you're going. So it predicts where you're going and the route that you're going to take to get there. So I have an app on my phone that, well, when I'm in my car, it's predicting, it's predicting those two things. And if it sees a problem with the route it thinks I'm taking, it alerts me and says, there's an accident on that route, or there's a backup on that route, take another route around. And that, other, that alternate route is one, again, that matches the way I like to drive. Not the optimal one, because that was blocked, but a different one. So we took that uh, work that we did in navigation, and we said, well, can we apply it to something that is a little less commercial, but still, but, and actually has some impact, could have some positive impact on the world. And so we started looking at this uh, arena of aggressive driving. So uh, there's about 17,000 fatal accidents per year, according to stats that are about four years old, um, and it's about 40 billion, cost of 40 billion dollars in the United States. Um, and so here, if you think about how, just a very simple interaction of how someone drives their car through an intersection, if you're going straight, taking a left, taking a right, taking a U-turn. If you just think of a very simple state system, from someone entering the system, being in the sorry, in entering the intersection, being in the inter intersection, taking some action, and then exiting the intersection. It's a fairly small, well-contained system. You can use people's patterns of behavior, their routines over time, to help you figure out are they an aggressive driver or are they not an aggressive driver. So one of my students, Nikola Banovich, um, this is part of his PhD. This was a simple, simple tablet interface that allowed you to see how a to view an, how an aggressive driver went through an intersection, and then the system would simulate how a non-aggressive driver would drive that, through that same system. So this is just straight going straight through the intersection, first one person speeding, one person on. So that's the aggressive behavior, and then superimposed, you'll see the uh, aggressive driver in light gray and the non-aggressive driver simulated non-aggressive driver. Now here you have someone taking a sharp left-hand turn. You'll see the aggressive driving first. And this is what was actually observed. So the person went through the intersection, hard brake, and then continued on. And then the simulated non-aggressive driver is much more smooth through the intersection, and actually gets through the intersection a lot faster. So um, with this kind of system, uh, there are two things that I think are really important. One is 
by studying the routines, we can actually build a better classifier and help figure out, is this should, after watching this person drive, can we classify this person as an aggressive driver or a non-aggressive driver, in which case there need to be interventions. Um, and then, based on how they're driving at the beginning of a drive, can you predict whether they're going to get more aggressive through their driving actions or less aggressive? And again, this would be an opportunity for intervention. Uh, Nicola published some work in, uh, in visualization where these are the four different states of uh, entering the intersection, being in it, uh, taking an action, and then exiting the intersection. Um, and through each of this, uh, these states, he's able to show which features of a model are, are active or most important in helping figure out the transitions between these different states. And this is really critical if you want to build a model of, of routine behavior. Um, one of the challenges here is how do you figure out when to intervene? Uh, we tried, uh, in a, a, as safe an environment as possible, we tried to figure that out. Um, obviously, when you're dealing with an aggressive driver, telling them that they drove aggressively right after they did it is not very palatable. <laughs> <laughs> they don't take to it very kindly. Uh, take, telling them at the end of the day seems to be too late. Maybe telling them at the next intersection? I don't know. I don't really know what the right what time to do it is. I don't know when you need to capture a batch of aggressive instances and then have them work with a coach. But trying to tease apart that how you present the intervention is something that I want to be able to work on, but we haven't had a chance to really engage with that yet. Next. Yeah. Do you collect any demographic data about the users? Yes. So we, for this study, we collected demographic information as well as uh, past driving record, history record, so speeding tickets, accidents, and then there's a standardized questionnaire for aggressive drivers. Okay, so it's like income or ethnicity or education or something like that. Yeah. Were they features? They were controlled for, uh, but they were not features in the system. Oh, sorry, they were not features that uh, emerged out of the data in the model. Good question. So. Um, in thinking about this tool that we've been designing around trying to understand these routines over time, we, uh, I, had, uh, I, I had a lot of good fortune to meet some really wonderful clinicians at the University of Pittsburgh um, who were interested in the kind of data that we were collecting around mobile phone use and said, can we apply it to medical uh, and, and health conditions? And so I had a colleague, um, Carissa Lowe, uh, who's a psycholo psychologist, uh, oncologist, at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, who worked with cancer patients. And she was interested with her patients, the patients in the population she worked with, uh, in trying to determine, uh, so they were coming into the hospital to get for cancer surgery, and um, what was the likelihood that they'd be readmitted in, in, within 60 days, which is obviously very important from, that, from a Medicare perspective, or from a health co healthcare reimbursement perspective. So if you're re readmitted within 30 days, there, you, you, you're, as a hospital, you get less money than if you your patients are not readmitted at all in the preferable case. So readmissions have lots of costs. They have stress on the family. They can result in death and obviously the financial cost. So typically in uh, a hospital setting, um, you only are sensed. I mean, if, for those of you who you know, have, have, have this fortune to be in the hospital, you know that this, there's a tremendous amount of sensing that's going on, but it's only while you're in the hospital bed, hospital room. Um, so you're in the hospital room, you're sensed, then you go home, and then we, if you're readmitted again, you're, you're, you're being sensed again. But there's this sort of lost opportunity to collect this kind of passive information about your behaviors. And some of that can be really useful for telling us this, you may, your risk for readmissions may be increasing. So we looked, at, um, we looked at collecting data from people through a wearable and a phone uh, about a month before they came into the hospital. Then the, the technology went away while they were in surgery, while they were in uh, in a recovery room, and then as soon as they, sorry, in the ICU, and then as soon as they went into a recovery room, we started the sensing again. And then we studied them for two months after discharge. Um, and I'm just going to pick, cherry, cherry pick a few of the results that sort of came out of our analysis of the routines that were, um, will hopefully make a little, uh, some sense to you. So over here on the right, I'll start over here. Um, this is each week after discharge, so five weeks after discharge. Um, and you can see in the blue are patients that were um, that were not readmitted, and the pink are the B-state patients that were readmitted. So you can see the variety in sleep, or the range in sleep that people got, was pretty dramatically different between those that were readmitted, not readmitted, than those that were. Every week, and it tended to get much worse after about week three. Or on the left, this is really telling us about how fit, how active they were, how many how many times they were getting up and moving around. Um, and what we saw is that. 
um, there were more people that, who were not, in, not really in the case that were up and moving around. And that shouldn't be a surprise, right? And what we can start to see is if we look at the weeks in which people were active, we can start to see movement within the hospital. Again, this is not surprising, but the weeks that were, uh, the, the activities that were within the hospital were really important to <coughs> lowering your risk for readmissions. So based on all of this, uh, Nicola's been working on this visualization, so I'm going to skip around a little bit in this video because there's uh, a little bit too much going on. But rem remember that state diagram that I was showing you earlier. So, uh, imagine this is the first state where we have information about uh, demographics, really all, any, any feature that you think might be relevant to trying to predict the three admissions or detect the admissions. Uh, and so you're able to see at this first state, which is you're not even in the hospital, you haven't had the surgery yet, what are the set of conditions and how are those broken down between those who are readmitted and those who eventually were not readmitted. You can, so you can see the scores for uh, different things. Some of it, it was patient-related, patient-generated, uh, like nausea score. Some of it was automatically detected. Some of it is statically generated. And you can say, oh, I want to highlight, and I want to look at particular aspects of these different features, and I want to see how it changes over time. So as they get closer and closer to the 60-day uh, window, or the 60-day 60, 60 readmissions, you can say, how does this change over time? So here you can start to ask a bunch of different questions. So again, this is very similar to the state diagram I showed earlier. So these are different states of the system, but here you're seeing how the features change over time. The actions or interventions, the actions that the user themselves, the patients themselves took, or the interventions that a clinician took, and how that changed over time, and how, if you were, if you were highlighting over these areas, how the, uh, the, the result changed. And so you can start to gain an understanding of how these different routines, again, either patient uh, designed or uh, clinical, clinically designed, are actually changing the, the final outcome. So we've been able to use this tool for a number of different uh, <coughs> systems that I want to talk about briefly. Um, and the tool has been really valuable. So, it, you know, the, the, the cynical side of me says, why don't we just take all that data, throw it to some recurrent neural network, and just get some, get some classifier out that's, that, that will tell you the outcome that you want. But that's actually not useful in helping us make decisions. We need to know why someone's changing. We need to understand why the system is making a particular prediction or particular detection, because that's how you can design interventions. And so the tool not only allows us to explore a lot of things, but automatically helps us extract the most the most important routines, the most important paths through a, a, a network of actions that impact the outcome. And that's really useful because that's a resource that we can, we can operationalize and a resource that we can use for computation. So another colleague came to me from the, uh, the University of Pittsburgh system and said, hey, I've seen what you guys are doing. Um, I do work in alcohol abuse. Can you help us design a system that can tell whether a college student is drinking alcohol? Um, and I said, what are the constraints? And he said, all you, all you can have is a mobile phone. And I said, no, there's, how can I tell whether someone's drinking? I mean, unless their phone is strapped to their wrist and I can see this behavior, I'm not going to be able to get it from their phone. He said, just, that was my gut reaction, because we got a lot of these phone calls, and most of them I didn't think we were capable of solving, uh, to, to addressing. And he said, just think about this for a little while and see if you can come up with something that would be useful. So we, we went away, we went, we went to a few bars, and we observed people drinking and said, is there something we can detect that differentiates those who are the designated driver, those who are not drinking, from those who are lightly drinking, to those who are binge drinking? Sorry, binge drinking, uh, the clinical definition is, uh, it's based on body mass index, but in general, for most women, it's more than uh, four drinks in a uh, two-hour period, and for most men, it's more than five drinks in a two-hour period. So, uh, lots of reasons why we want to do that, uh, and we found that uh, our initial results told us there was a lots of interesting things. So obviously, you can tell by gait. So uh, how people walk across the room, you can tell that they had too much to drink or whether they didn't. You can tell when they crossed a particular threshold of drinking. Um, the, the loudness of voices change. Even the pitch of their voices change. Um, you, we saw, although we couldn't quite put our fingers on it, what was happening, but we saw that the way they were interacting with their phones seemed to be changing too. So I said, okay, well this at least gives me enough belief that maybe there, there's a chance we can address this problem. Let's start collecting some data. So we had a very small population that we started with, uh, about 38 patients. 
had 20, 21 of them came from the emergency room. So they were in the emergency room for something unrelated to alcohol abuse. Um, but they had filled out one of our screeners and that said that made them very likely to have uh, been experiencing a binge drinking episode. And then we recruited 17 random adults, young adults from the from, uh, varsity pool. We gave them a software that we ran on their phones, um, and then we asked them to wear one of these tracking devices. Um, that we did it in the summertime when even in Pittsburgh people wear shorts in the summertime, um, and you can, you can imagine it was not particularly. Uh, acceptable. Uh, these were devices that they couldn't take off themselves. They had to wear these for four weeks. Uh, you wear them in the shower, which is great. They're really cheap. To, you, you rent them and you pay just by the day. It's like a couple dollars, a, four dollars a day uh, for each time each day they're activated. So that's really great. Um, but we couldn't actually get people to wear them for more than a couple of weeks. So we said we had to come up with some other way. And so we relied on uh, experience sampling, which is not, you know, I will, I will take all the uh, caveats around uh, experience sampling. So this is what we got back in terms of our experience sampling. So uh, gray means no drinking, uh, blue is light drinking or regular drinking, and orange are, uh, is heavy drinking or, or binge drinking. And you can see some people that, I don't know, they didn't report many episodes, but most of what they reported were uh, drinking episodes. Like this person here reported a lot of episodes, and most of them were drinking episodes. We had some people in our study uh, that when they, even when they were wearing the scram bracelet, the, the, the detection device, that were that had alcohol in their system more than 12 hours a day. Uh, you know, it's what you get on a college campus. In some college campuses. Uh, so, as you would expect, time of day and day of week are hugely predictive of uh, if you want to build the model. So, most of the drinking episodes happen uh, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Although you can see that for some of them, it happens throughout the week. And the time of day really made a difference. So we're starting to see most of the real drinking activity, I don't know where you want to start, but maybe 8 o'clock on and ending about 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it is interesting to see sort of the balance between the drinking, light like drinking and heavy drinking. And so we started looking at what are the features that were really indicative. And again, we plotted this out. We used our visualization tool and we started looking at um, routines of individuals to see uh, which uh, whether we could identify routines that particular people had that told us whether they were drinking or not, and then later whether they were binge drinking or not. And some of the features that our system pulled out were interesting to us because we didn't expect them. The checkout gate was useless because um, most, of the, most of the students in our study, when they were binge drinking, they didn't move. So all that thing, idea of all the people walking around was, it was no value because the phones weren't really moving. But a couple of features that we found. Again, I'm cherry picking some of the data because I think just I think it's interesting. But uh, screen usage. So this is the number of unlocks per minute uh, when you're not drinking. Uh, 13 per minute. That's one, one every five seconds. Which seems very high, but that's what it is. And then but you can see that there's a real, an easy way to differentiate these three classes just on the amount of time someone was unlocking their phone. And then the length of, direct, uh, of the interactions was much higher for those that were binge drinking than it was for the other two categories. Um, what was interesting, and maybe not surprising in hindsight, is key press interaction. So if you think of someone who's inebriated, they're work, starting to work a little bit more slowly, they're starting to make a lot more mistakes, and that totally shows up in our data. So on the far left, you see the time between key presses, and so you can see it's much higher for those in that heavy drinking category, the number of times they delete a text, number of times they re-enter the text. So those are really high. So those are useful in, from a detection perspective. Overall, using routines, we could build a model that was 95% accurate at detecting non-drinking from drinking from binge drinking. And that's within about half an hour of the drinking episode. Um, the baseline, if you just went with predicting everybody was not drinking all the time, was 82%. So you can see it's a reasonable increase. Um, we have some new work that hopefully will get uh, submitted for a publication in a couple of days that is looking at um, whether we can predict future episodes of binge drinking. Now, this is not very far into the future, and we get best results by predicting one hour ahead. So you're not drinking right now, and we're trying to predict one hour ahead into the future. Using not the previous nine hours of data, we're about 87% accurate at being able to detect this drinking or binge drinking. And again, um, we've been using this, this, these models of routines to be able to elicit that information. I want to talk about one more project before I sort of bring this to a close and sort of summarize where we're, where, where we're going, where we're trying to go. Um, oh, sorry, one more thing. 
the binge drinking work has been so successful that we've been integrated into a 5,000 person uh, uh, random control trial in Pittsburgh. Um, which led to some uh, early work, or uh, an early pilot funding from the National Institutes for Health on uh, studying cognitive effects of marijuana. So now you can say, it's, um, again, if you think of someone who's uh, been smoking marijuana and uh, their, their time, but the reaction time, um, when you can look at, you know, look at eye gaze from the front-facing camera, and you can look at how their eye gaze is changing over time. Uh, you can't quite do people's size with most of the front-facing cameras. You can do a lot of interesting things, even looking at blood flow in people's faces. So we're trying to use this information to understand better how, what those effects are on uh, somebody who's smoking marijuana. And we're in the midst of working on a grant to start looking at the technical opioid cravings. Uh, so this last project that I want to talk about also is one very much in progress. Uh, and this is a project to study uh, student health. It was hugely inspired by some work that Andrew Campbell did at uh, Dartmouth University, Dartmouth College, uh, called Student Life. And it was a study of a, one particular class that Andrew was teaching. Um, and he collected mobile phone data, and he had some a an Android wearable watch. And he was really looking at, could he detect student health issues, primarily mental health issues, um, from, that, from the data that he could collect? Um, and so inspired by that, we have been, we collected a 200 person, roughly 200 person uh, uh, data set at CMU, mostly freshmen, first year students. And so we collected Fitbit information, we had data from their smartphone, uh, and we collected self-assessment. And we were interested in a whole lot of things from, it says right there, depression, suicidality, loneliness, academics, how connected they felt to each other, how connected they felt to the university, how resilient, or how much, uh, uh, sometimes it, the word grit is used. Um, we're also really interested in positive outcomes. One thing I didn't say about all of this work is um, I'm not just interested in finding the health problems. One thing that I'm personally uh, uh, challenged by is whether we can identify best practices in people's behaviors. So if you find a particular cohort where that share, they share the same demographics, same, share same genetic information, share same environmental information, share something in common, and some of those people are performing pretty well and some of those are not, what are the change? What are the differences between those two sets of two groups? And can you identify the best practices of this group and apply it to the other? I don't actually know if that will work, but it's something that I'm really, I'm really, I find personally compelling, and it's something I'm hoping this work will allow us to do. Um, I say most of the results are embargoed right now. Uh, my previous institution is concerned about uh, us revealing anything about how depressed students might be on the Carnegie Mellon campus. Um, so. Uh, as of this morning, uh, this, so I have a student that's working on three different problems. One is, can, uh, with no information, no uh, pre-semester information, just only post-semester information, can she uh, detect or predict, detect what the end of semester depression score is on a standard size scale, um, depressed or not? Can she, and then the second question is, can she, uh, with the pre-depression, pre-semester depression scale, can she detect whether there should change from not depressed to depressed, or showing, exhibiting depressed, depressive symptoms? And then the third one, which is much harder, is can she detect the amount of change on this scale? Um, she's not so good on that third one, but for the first one, uh, which is just detecting that post-semester depression, it's about 83%. Not where we want to be, and not where it needs to be to be really accurate in using the intervention, but maybe as an early warning indication in addition to all the normal assessments and things that might occur on the college campus. Um, we've been engaged in three different follow-ups. So we did a, so that, that data was collected last uh, January, uh, last uh, spring semester. And so this, half, this current semester, we, we completed the study again. We did about half our students were from the group that we did last year, so they're now sophomores. And we did half from uh, that are freshmen again. And we're adding a genetic component. So we're working with a group that's doing uh, uh, at no, I'll remember this one in a second. They have this great program called Spit for Science, so they get their all their students to spit, and they collect that new genetic testing on it. Um, and along with uh, a few other sensing streams like social media. Um, and then at the same time, my wife has uh, at, when she moved to the University of Washington in the fall, she started a new study at University of Washington with about 200 students, and her focus has been on, particularly on identifying sexual assault, discrimination, and uh, significant life events, being able to detect those from the data and seeing how changes in people's routines uh, are impacted by uh, those life events. And then finally, uh, we have a study that's going to start next month, fingers crossed, in June, um, where it's part of the UCLA Grand Challenge around depression. 
So their goal is to reduce the um, burden of depression by half by the year 2050, so a 20 year goal, uh, oh, sorry, 30 year goal. Um, and so our pilot is with 4,000 students, and the goal is in a couple of years to raise, raise it up to 100,000, not students, but 100,000 people from the community. So we're going to have access to this amazing amount of data, mostly because all of you carry around the exact devices that we think are valuable for dealing with these health issues, for dealing with these driving issues. For, and, and the computation can be simple enough that after we do the visualization, after we extract the, the knowledge that we need to, we can run everything on your phone. So from a privacy perspective, ideally, data never needs to leave your phone in order for an appropriate intervention. No, we're not there yet. That's, that, that's at least the goal. So this kind of modeling can uh, enable a lot of different kinds of activities. And I, I, this is basically the same slide that I showed before. But the thing I want to highlight, the things that we're working on right now, we're coming up with a computational definition of routine. So from a software engineering perspective, it's not enough to be able to model it, but we have to have a way to represent what a routine is. And it's still very challenging. Uh, I have this notion in my head of what a routine is, but I can't quite uh, uh, nail it down. If, uh, and if, once we do that, we can actually create a routine object as a first class object in our reason in reasoning systems and build applications around that. And then we want to actually build a whole tool pipeline uh, to be able to work with routines. So, um, to me, the idea of uh, escalating from raw context to inferred context to routines has been a sort of a nat natural progression. Um, and to me, it's really exciting that you can, we do have the capability through all the devices that have been used, that you all have used, to be able to, to get to get at this, and to work on what I find very compelling problems. So here's a list of my collaborators. There's contact information at the bottom if you want to come, if you want to shoot me an email sometime later. Um, and right now, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks for coming up. So the, the main thing we've been looking at, so um, right now we collect everything, we post everything on our server, right? Because yeah. I, want to, I need to be able to analyze it. In the ideal world, once we're sort of past this research phase and this, the science phase, yeah. that phase, that we'd be able to say, okay, we've built this model, and maybe, yes, it may need to get updated over time, but all of that can happen on your phone. So if it ne the data never has to leave your phone, then we're dealing with a security issue, not a privacy issue. Mm -hmm. That's the goal, we're not there. Um, so we talked about this a little bit before, but um, I've been thinking about this challenge with we have this this notion increasingly that people should be in control of their own data and have the right to be forgotten and all of these other kinds of things. And I'm wondering about a future state, and I worry about this with medical trials too, in which when we have full control, then the results of our models are going to privilege a certain set of people, um, and those people are the safest and the least vulnerable and the most willing and able to accept these things. And I'm just wondering what you think about how we can deal with those kinds of things as we develop our models. Yeah, so we have thought a little bit about this. Part of the answer, I mean, we don't have any great answers for this, but um, part of it is, uh, in an ideal world, everybody's data would contribute to their own individual model, but then it would also contribute to a population model, because a, 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 uh, having more data will always improve a population, a, a model for a larger population, which will hopefully uh, positively impact those people who don't want to be tracked so closely because you can get, you can leverage other people's data to help them. Um, the challenge, though, is how do you take the data from those individuals when I just said, well, it's never going to leave your phone. Now I want to move it to another platform. How do I abstract it enough so that it's still, it, that I'm not releasing any personal information, but it's still useful for me to create the population model? I don't think anybody knows how to do that. One of the earlier slides, you talk about um, some future potential tracking could be um, from intent to an engagement. Do you feel um, engagement is something like you, know, you can start working towards after you understand your intent, or you can start building, like, maybe we can improve engagement as we're tracking them? I think, you can, I think that's the latter. I think you can under start to understand people's engagement um, as on the way to understanding their intent. I look at all of those things that were on that slide as things that will impact our ability to understand human intent, but not things that I, I don't need to know your intent to understand engagement. I mean, that would be helpful, but I think it's the other way around. So knowing how 
I'm interacting with you uh, and, and being able to measure that, both how I'm interacting with you, how I'm interacting with this group, how I'm interacting with devices, all things that tell my level of engagement and maybe a level of distraction. And that all, are, all of that can be used to understand why am I doing what I'm doing and the system can use that to try and uh, provide me appropriate services or not at, at a given time. But I definitely see engagement as one of these things that you want to be able to infer in order to understand it. Just a follow up yeah. question. Um, in the case of the senior who is having a decline and then we didn't pick it up on time and he just had a fall and he passed away. Right. Do you feel like maybe um, work in the future can start building that engagement? When the time where uh, during the decline, we can start providing like real time or oh, oh, I'm sorry, I think I misunderstood your question. You're talking about what level of inter intervention? At what at what point can we have preemptive intervention uh, so that you can address a negative or somebody who's who's in decline but has not uh, yet suffered a, a, a significant incident? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was having a great conversation with one of your faculty this morning about who are these. Who are the workers that are going to exist that will actually monitor that data? Can that be automated? I don't know. I feel uncomfortable with having that completely automated. There are some things that could be. Um, but I do feel like this might be generating, and this is actually something that came up from uh, uh, Robert Wood Johnson work that uh, Jillian was on and I was on. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, I don't remember the name of the project. Was. Project Health Design. Thank you. Project Health Design. Um, where the idea that all of these teams, the five, about five teams, are all working on building systems that produce more data that can be used for health interventions. But it was very clear that there had to be this new, new, set, new type of job created of people that can monitor this data. And I fully believe that some of it can be automated, but not all of it. So um, it needs to happen, but I don't know who those people are going to be, or what skills they're going to have to have to be competent. So um, Martha Feldman, who some of you might know, is a sociologist who studies routines and happens to be here at UCI. And she found that routines are dynamic. So contrary to popular belief right. that routines are stable, they're very dynamic, very changing. But how are you taking this into account? Can your, can your technology detect this kind of change in routine? So I would say at this point, no. And, and we, we're taking a really simplistic approach. Or we have these simplistic ideas of how to approach this. So um, if you think about the window of time over which routines are stable, in which case, you know, that never happens. But let's assume you have a particular window over, uh, over which routines are stable. And you can build a model there. Can you have models that are built with diff at different, on different time scales, different uh, sizes of window, and then keep sliding those along? So you have multiple models that are being built at the same time. Some of them are looking for is this anomaly. Some are saying, is this a change routine? And some of this is this is the routine continuing. So in my head, that has possibilities, but we haven't built it yet to know for sure. I mean, I see a kind of variability around the routine right. through which maybe if people go a few standard deviations outside of that variability, then it's maybe a change in the routine. Right. Figuring out what that Exactly, and how to uh, personalize it for every individual. Um, so I was wondering, so uh, what if the users uh, like lie about their uh, information, like contextual information, because they you know, want to um, avoid disclosing some significant information? Will it uh, influence the uh, prediction of the Completely. Yeah. Uh, so in cases where the user themselves are generating content that is the ground truth, that they lie, then the models will just be as bad as those lies are. Uh, or uh, they'll have the out they'll output the, the, the lies and not the truth. Um, in many cases, we're trying to triangulate. So we have some information about ground truth here, some information about ground truth here. And we're triangulating that with the person's own self-report. It's a really hard problem uh, and figuring out how to build a model in the absence of, and not even just lies, but mistakes or uh, misperceptions is really challenging. You know, there's a lot of people that are interested in trying to use this kind of data to uh, predict or detect mood, which is fundamentally a very challenging problem. Um, but I don't think I can assess my own mood most of the time. And so there's so much error just in my own self reports so that any model you build, I, I'd be very, I, I question that the validity. Okay, I would 
white to green onions. 